Uh, I'm super excited about something that I read yesterday, and I feel like I need to begin by telling you uh, this revolutionary sentence. I was skimming a book yesterday, and this one sentence stuck out to me, and I told everybody who was at our church building this sentence, and they were blown away, and, and you might be blown away too. Uh, concerning preaching, concerning preaching, the author said this, preaching is characteristic of Christianity. Pretty unimpressive, right? Uh, he went on to say, no false religion has ever provided for the regular and frequent assembling of the masses of people to hear biblical instruction and exhortation. Surely some have attempted to imitate Christians, but so far to this day, preaching as it remains is a peculiar Christian institution. And this is what blew my mind, that I never thought, I just never thought about it, but only Christians preach. No other group of people regularly opens the Bible and explains it to their people. In the past few months, I know by experience, I have talked, I have been across the table from a Catholic priest. Uh, most recently, two days ago, I was sitting with a bishop of a Mormon, uh, of the Mormon religion. I've met with over seven Mormon, quote unquote, missionaries in the last couple months, Muslims. And after reading that sentence, I affirm that none of them regularly teach their people God's objective, living and active word. To be clearly understood, it's right there. We don't have to talk about dreams and visions and all that. If we wanna know what God knows, we simply open his word. And that's why perhaps many of those people are confused. I don't want you to be confused. Union Gospel Mission does not want you to be confused. And so we have opened the word of God, and by God's grace, I'm going to preach. All right, let's pray together. Uh, Father, uh, you have ordained preaching. Uh, from the beginning of uh, redemptive history, you have ordained it. Because your word, as you said, is living and active. Uh, your spirit uh, wrote your word. Your spirit is in the hearts, uh, is working on people to bring about conviction concerning sin, righteousness, judgment, and our need of you. And your whole entire word also proclaims the sufficiency and need of Jesus Christ the Lord. And so we pray again that you would Show us uh, your glory in his face. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, our text this morning is, uh, begins in Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And I'm going to read it uh, to begin with. As I read our text this morning, I want you to observe three specific people. The Pharisee, the woman, and Jesus uh, our Lord. Luke chapter 7, verse 36, begins like this. But one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Verse 41. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, 
the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water from my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I'm going to stop right there. Amen. The word is living and active just by reading it. Huh? I'm going to frame this text for us this morning in four sections. Four sections. The setting the scene, the parable, and the point, okay? The setting, the scene, the parable, and the point. First, uh, the setting, and the setting is in one verse, it's in verse 36. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table, okay? Just to make it clear, and I don't, I'm not sure what your spiritual background is, uh, what is a Pharisee? Uh, what is a Pharisee? Well, uh, the Pharisees, just to summarize, were the religious leaders at the time. And by way of our account here, uh, it's helpful for you to know they are popular. Uh, they were smart. Uh, they were elevated and esteemed highly by the people. Outwardly, they were a goody two-shoes. Super nice. Everybody uh, respected them. But Jesus saw uh, deeper than the external. He said that they did that because they loved the praise of people rather than God. They love to pray out loud and use big words that nobody could understand to show how holy they were. They love to put their good works on display, Jesus said in Matthew 6. They love to show their piety. They love following the costless commands of God while neglecting the commands that actually cost them. They are hypocrites, the Lord said, lovers of money. They compare themselves to others instead of to God. And it says here in the verse, in the opening verse, that this Pharisee was asking, or he was repeatedly asking uh, in, the, in the original language, insisting that Jesus share a meal with him, that Jesus eat with him. Okay? Uh, as a reminder, sharing a meal together, it was important in this culture. It meant association. It meant fellowship. Uh, you took a selfie back then if you were eating with somebody and posted it on Instagram and said, we're buddies, this is my homie. And so why does this Pharisee invite Jesus if they are usually offended um, by Jesus in the scripture? Why invite Jesus to a meal? Why be friendly with him if he is being loved by the people? And the answer is, by way of reminder, a Pharisee is someone who associates with God to gain something other than God. A Pharisee is someone who is friendly to Jesus to get something other than Jesus. Does that describe you? Well, uh, the Pharisee, he asks Jesus to a, to a meal, and Jesus took him up on the offer. And one more thing to show you uh, by way of uh, uh, the setting is that they're reclined at the table. And that word reclined is, in, is on purpose at mealtime. Uh, if you know, they reclined when they ate rather than sitting at a table. You know, there's that painting of the Last Supper where all the disciples are sitting at a table. Jesus, that's not what it looked like at all. Uh, the table was like U-shaped and it was more like a, a couch. And they would kind of you know, everybody would be facing the middle and would be reclined. Their feet, without their sandals, would be uh, lining the outside. Okay? Uh, their heads were torn, to, uh, and their heads were tor turned towards one another. Uh, and an interesting custom at that time was that meals, um, strangers were allowed to enter the house uninvited as guests, especially a public 
uh, meal like this. And we, and we know this meal had a level of publicity because the woman enters, as we read in the next verse, but also there are others present around this scene in verse 49. And so it's a feast. It's a feast. That's the setting. Okay, next, the scene. Uh, look at verse 37. Uh, we're going to let the scene unfold. In verse 37, Luke commands us to look at the woman. That's what the word behold means. Hey, look at this. Behold. And we find out some things about this woman. She's described as a woman of the city. She lived there. People knew her, obviously. She's described by God's word as a sinner. The detail of her sin is left out, but by the way everybody's reacting, she's probably a prostitute uh, or an adulteress. Think sexual immorality. Besides her being a sinner, we know nothing else of her identity. And we know nothing else. Uh, some of you today, I met for the first time uh, about an hour ago. And besides being a sinner, I know nothing else about your identity but I know that you are a sinner. And since I am a sinner as well, then we already have one huge thing in common, okay? So that we have this in common with this woman. And what does she do? Verse 37 says, she learned where Jesus was. She brought an alabaster flask of perfume. Alabaster was an expensive type of marble from Egypt. That's what the perfume is stored in. And since alabaster is expensive, we know that the perfume inside had to be expensive because nobody, the storage container is never more valuable than what's inside. Uh, an expensive, valuable storage container is meant to protect or um, preserve something that's valuable inside. And verse 38 adds, she stood behind Jesus' feet, so the, the U-shaped table, she's knelt down where everybody's feet are. She gets behind Jesus' feet. She uh, begins crying, and her tears begin to wet his feet, and she began to wipe his feet. Uh, but since she had no towel, she used her hair, which was shocking to some, because to the Jews, it was a shameful thing in that culture for a woman to let down her hair, let alone wipe somebody's feet with them. But she feels no reservation that we see. Maybe she's used to being shamed. Maybe the shame didn't matter. But she has no reservation. She's also kissing Jesus' feet. And that sounds odd to us, but to this culture, it was a sign of deep honor and reverence. Kissing on the cheek, especially uh, more informally, was a sign of gratitude and thankfulness. And, and she took the perfume and used that to also apply to the feet of Jesus. And surely, just imagine, the smell of that is filling the room. This woman interrupted the meal gathering, but she has not asked for anything. You know, beggars would usually come to these dinners and, and ask for food or for money. She asked for nothing, nor does she gain anything. It actually costs her. It costs her the perfume and also costs her exposure to public ridicule. How do the people respond in watching this? How they respond? Well, we know how the homeowner responded. He was embarrassed. He was embarrassed for himself. He was embarrassed for his house guests, but he was especially embarrassed for Jesus' sake. Look at verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he didn't say it out loud. He talks to himself. He says, Ugh. you know, you might have heard it when I read it. Man, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this, who this lady is touching him, right? This woman is well known. People know her name. People know her bad reputation. And I said she's probably sexually immoral. Why is she touching Jesus? Man, why does she feel so comfortable to come into the dinner party and start touching him? What have they been doing that we don't know about? That's what he's, that's what he's thinking, Letting her hair down, washing, kissing, anointing. This could damage reputation, Jesus' reputation. Because you know Pharisees are all about reputation. And the fact that Jesus didn't shoo this woman off immediately causes the Pharisee to doubt Jesus as Messiah. In our English translation, he says, man, if this... Well, he didn't say man, but he goes, if this man were a prophet... And in the Greek... 
construction there, he is assuming that Jesus is not a prophet when he says that. In this scene, I want you to see this. We know that everyone's eyes are on the woman. It's clear. The Pharisees' eyes are watching the woman. The crowd's eyes are watching the woman. Our eyes are watching the woman. But who is the woman looking at? Jesus. Jesus. She's not looking at everybody else, nor is she looking at her own self. Her eyes are fixed on Jesus. And I'll pause because some of you are like this woman. Some of you are like her. And I need to give you encouragement because that's where the word of God goes here. And some of you have your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. And yet even still, there are people looking at you, shaming you perhaps, persecuting you, ridiculing you, maybe ridiculing you for being at Union Gospel Mission or working at Union Gospel Mission. You keep your eyes on him, okay? You keep your eyes on him. Sometimes following Jesus costs you things like time, resource, and reputation, but it doesn't matter if a Pharisee doesn't understand. It doesn't matter if people know your reputation from the past. It doesn't matter if you still struggle with sin. Jesus died for that sin. Jesus died for that shame. You keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Don't worry about other people's judgment. Don't worry about the townspeople's criticism. Don't worry about your coworker's opinion. Don't worry about people here at the mission who might oppose you. You keep pursuing Christ. Amen. You keep loving him. You keep busting your perfume on him. He is more valuable than any of those things. Amen. Be like her in that sense. Don't mind if people want to disassociate with you. You make sure that you keep associating with Jesus. Listen, the Pharisee himself sees who the woman is. And the woman sees who Christ is. If God is for you, who can be against you? Romans 8.31. Right? People can say all they want about you, but one day, if they remain opposed to Christ, God will say something to them. And God does say something to the Pharisee, to Simon. Because although Simon, the Pharisee, did not speak his little thing out loud, oh man, if this man were a prophet, although he doesn't speak it out loud, Jesus, who is God, hears him. And in verse 40, he says, Simon, I have something to say to you. First time Luke records his name, and Simon says, go for it. Now comes the parable. Uh, So next, uh, the parable. And the parable is for Simon. Parable is simple. You understood it when I read it in the beginning. Two people owe money. Two different amounts of debt. Both are unable to repay their debt. And one moneylender forgives them both. Okay, look at verse 41 again. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Stop right there. Weird word, denarii. Uh, a denarius, a, a, as a reminder, some of you I'm sure know this, a denarius was one day's wages, one full day's wages. Therefore, one denarius equals one day work. So 500 denarii, plural, is equal to 500 days pay, a year and a half salary. That's how much one owes. And the other owes 50 denarii, or 50 days work, or maybe a month and a half salary. Either way, Dave Ramsey would be mad at both of them because you should not have debt, according to him, okay? You should not have debt. And the money lender forgave them both. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. He canceled it. He forgave it, that word is. He gifted it. He gave them the debt. Uh, if, if, if you have $10,000 debt and somebody forgives the debt, that's the same as making $10,000. The money lender gifted them what they owed. But unlike other similar sounding parables that Jesus taught, The emphasis here is not on the value of what was owed. The emphasis here is not on the act of the moneylender, even. The emphasis is on 
how they respond. How they respond. Look at verse 42 again. Jesus asked, now which of them, two debtors, will love he who forgave more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said, you have judged rightly. Uh, duh. Yeah, that's an easy answer. Even a non-believer can understand this parable. That's why Simon said, I suppose. He felt that it couldn't be that obvious. Like, wow, teacher, duh. And yet there's more to it because Jesus goes on to explain the parable to Simon. Jesus goes on to blast Simon in front of the whole dinner party. Look at verse 44. Then turning toward the woman. I love that. I love that. That is very intentional because Jesus is giving her encouragement. I see you. And I see you unlike everybody else who's looking at you right now. Jesus sees the woman just like he sees you when you worship him, whether it's in a closet or in public, he sees you. Turning toward the woman, Jesus said to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman, verse 44? Answer, Simon does not see the woman. I, so, I told you before he was looking at her, but he does not see her. He cannot see her accurately because he cannot see himself accurately. Let me explain that. Matthew 7, you know it. You cannot see to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye if you've got a big old log sticking out of your eye. Simon cannot see because he's got this big log in his face and he's trying to be like, ooh, if Jesus saw. So Jesus is going to help him. Jesus is going to help him. He compares Simon to the woman in three different areas. Three different ways that he's going to compare Simon to her. First, begins with hospitality in verse 44. It begins with hospitality. There's a difference. Simon, he's the one who invited Jesus over to the house. Jesus is Simon's guest. And this was a sandal culture, so it was custom for water to be given to wash feet. Because they didn't have nice clean roads like we do. They were nasty. So it was custom at a party for water to be given to wash feet. Or in rich people's homes, there were house servants who actually washed the feet of those who were invited to the party. And it was done with water, a basin, and a towel. You know, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, Peter was like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? Like, please don't take that posture. Simon invited Jesus over, and there was no water given to wet Jesus' feet, and no towel to wipe them off. But the woman, this was not her house, and Jesus is not her guest. And yet she is the one who washes Jesus' feet, not with water, but with tears. And she doesn't wipe them off with a towel, she wipes them with her hair. Next, Jesus compares their greetings. In verse 45, Jesus says, Simon did not give Jesus a kiss. And as I said, that was a customary greeting to show respect and friendship. You remember Judas betrayed Jesus with a normal greeting, a kiss. Peter commands believers to greet one another with a kiss of love. Paul commands believers to greet one another with a holy kiss five times in his letters. It was cultural. It was normal. Paul says, holy kiss, by the way, because some of y'all need to know, need to be reminded that it is a holy kiss. <laughs> Kissing was especially the ceremonial welcome given to guests. You kissed equals on the face. You kissed authorities like parents or teachers or rulers on the hand. And the people who you most deeply revered or were humbling yourself before you kiss their feet. It's typical. And Jesus said, Simon didn't have give his guest Jesus any of them. Not even the normal one on the face, let alone the one with the most deepest reverence. But the woman, she kissed Jesus' feet repeatedly, the text said. The mark of humility because of the value of Christ. Third, Jesus compares their anointing in verse 46. 
Simon did not anoint Jesus' head with oil or olive oil, uh, culturally. Uh, this was not required, but again, it was a special courtesy usually given to guests. Okay, it's not a, to be clear, it's not a ceremonial anointing. This is not a quote-unquote religious anointing. The word anoint in the Greek literally only means to, to rub or apply, uh, to apply. Uh, olive oil in this time was used like lotion or moisturizer, or, or something to refresh people. Maybe the closest modern day thing would be hand sanitizer, like, oh, welcome, you know, and you know, do that. But it was that which was, which was given that people uh, could use and, and were in need of. Uh, and, it was, and olive oil is relatively inexpensive. And Jesus says, Simon did not even apply cheap olive oil like is usually done to guests in your home. But the woman, she didn't use cheap olive oil. She takes the most expensive perfume stored in an expensive alabaster jar, and that's what she anoints Jesus with. And not on his head, the equals on his feet. What is Jesus showing Simon? Look at verse 47. What is Jesus showing him? Jesus says in verse 47, Therefore I, Jesus, tell you, Simon, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Jesus is explaining the parable. Okay? He's explaining the parable. Listen, to be clear, the parable does not deal with the amount of sin in a person's life. The parable is not talking about the amount of sin in a person's life, but the awareness of sin in their heart. The amount of the awareness of your own sin. The woman's sin was public and everybody knew about them. Simon's sin, especially of pride, was hidden to everyone except God. And maybe this fact made him feel like he had less sin. It was super easy for Simon to say, she is a sinner. But it was impossible for him to say, I am a sinner. You see that? Super easy for him to see her sin. Completely blind when it comes to his own sin. And yet, just like in the parable, they, were, they are both bankrupt before God. Whether it's 500 denarii or 50, you're both bankrupt. How do we know Simon was not aware of his sin? Because of his reaction to the forgiver. Because of his reaction to the forgiver. Jesus said in verse 47, whoever is forgiven the most loves the forgiver the most. Great love comes out of great forgiveness. You cannot manufacture love for Jesus Christ. You can't manufacture it artificially. Your love for Jesus is in proportion to the awareness of your own sin. Yeah, I'll say that again. Your love for Jesus is in direct proportion to the awareness that you have of your own sin. Amen. He who is forgiven much loves Christ much, but he who is forgiven much also loves others much, according to 1 John chapter 4. Loves people more. When you fail to love the people that you're supposed to, it's usually because you think you are better than they are. Um, let me ask you something. I was, a, I was a waiter at one time in my life. Eric Rios remembers. Um, being a waiter, when I go to restaurants now, working as a waiter changed forever the way I tip people. Okay? You know who are the biggest tippers usually? It's usually people who have worked and experienced what it's like to do that. Between rich people and poor people, do you know who's usually most generous with their resources when it comes to percentage? Poor people. Do you know who loves Christ and people the most? The ones who are most aware of their own sin. Are you a self-righteous Simon? 
how would you welcome Jesus Christ into your home? And what I mean by is, how do you welcome Jesus in your life? Do you love him? Do you worship him? Do you value him? Or do you value something else more, convenience? Is he, is, is he worth sacrifice to you? Do you despise other Christians when they are recognized and accepted by him? Do you compare your debt to everybody else's debt and say, well, at least my debt is not as bad as theirs? Do you criticize those who you think owe God more than you? Do you cringe when you see other Christians going all out for the Savior? Do you love sinners or do you condemn sinners? And I'm not talking about in word. I'm talking about in action. I need to ask those questions, even for you who believe. Because self-righteousness is a dangerous thing, and self-righteousness is the, is the direction that we always fall. We never fall towards more dependence on Jesus. We fall towards depending on our own self. In verse 47, and Jesus says, The woman sins, although many are forgiven, because she loved much. But Simon is not forgiven. Is that what it says? No. It says, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. Jesus doesn't say Simon's name here because as long as Simon has breath in his lungs, he has a choice. He can change. He can, his eyes can be open to see his sin. And if you are like Simon, you can change too. What will you think about Jesus? That's the question. That's the question here. And that's the question for all of your life. What do you think of him? If you are indifferent to Jesus, it's probably because you are indifferent to your own sin. Well, that's the parable. And lastly, let's get on to the point. And the point of the text that I want you to see is this. If you love Jesus Christ, you can be 100% assured that you are forgiven of all your sin. If you love him, if you desire to serve him and worship him, and if you have no problem humiliating yourself before him, humbling yourself, you don't have to think one second whether or not he has forgiven you or not. You can't do that unless you have been forgiven by him. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about your sin. I already told you that. If you love Jesus Christ, Jesus will defend you just like he defended the woman here. We sang that song, Lord, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh Lord, how I need you. And if I have you, I always have a defense. Amen. I always have your righteousness speaking for me. If you love him, God will defend you. Jesus' righteousness will defend you. The love of God will defend you, Romans 8. The promises of God will defend you. The spirit of God inside you will defend you. The cross will always defend you if your faith is in him. That's the point. We know that the woman loves Jesus Christ. We know that she does. Now look at verse, eight, uh, verse 48. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, the English Standard Version, this translation could be, I have a preference here. If you have NASB, or I think even King James, or Legacy, NAS says, your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. There is a difference there. The reason why NAS translates, translates it like that, because this tense this verb tense is the perfect tense. The perfect tense is something that has happened in the past that is still affecting the present. Something that has happened in the past that is still affecting the present. Okay? What Jesus is saying then when he says this is that the woman's sins were forgiven before the event in Simon's house. Her sins were forgiven already. Her love in that moment, that's not what earned her forgiveness. Her love there was just an outward expression of something that already happened 
prior to this. And what else, what happened before this? Answer, faith. That's why in verse 50, when Jesus says, your faith has saved you, listen, your faith has saved you is also in the perfect tense. Her faith happened before Simon's house, and it's still continuing. She believed in Christ prior to Simon's house. She probably, maybe she heard him in the synagogue preaching from far away because she would have been accepted in the inner court. Maybe she heard that Jesus forgives sin. Maybe she heard that he forgave the paralytic sin in Luke chapter 5. Maybe she heard of Jesus' kindness and healing people and dining with tax collectors and prostitutes and casting out demons from them like it will show us in Luke chapter 8. Maybe she heard of the young man getting resurrected in the beginning of Luke 7. Whatever she heard about him, we know this, she believed it. She believed it. She put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and she was therefore forgiven of all her sin. And she was therefore saved. And when she had the opportunity to express her love for Jesus, she didn't hold back. She didn't hesitate. She didn't think about considering the shame because her eyes were not on herself. Her eyes were on Jesus, her forgiver. And because of her faith, Jesus saved her. Because her love for Jesus affirmed that she was forgiven of all her sin, Jesus, Jesus gives her one command. Go in peace, verse 50. Go in peace. Walk in peace. Live in peace. However you translate it, it means the same thing. Whatever you do, dear woman, from here on out, do it in peace. This woman probably never had peace in her whole life before Jesus. She probably never knew peace her whole entire life. What is the opposite of peace? Answer, war. Anger, fights, depression, anxiety, endless worry, fear, shame, guilt. Those are all the opposite of peace. Peace is the absence of those things. This woman probably never had peace in her whole life until she put her trust in Jesus. Maybe you've never had peace in your whole entire life. It's impossible to have peace unless you've been forgiven of your sin. Without that, it's impossible to have peace. Romans 5.1 says, Having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 32, how happy is the person whose sin is forgiven and covered. Psalm 103, God pardons all your iniquities. Isaiah 43, God says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Colossians 2, 13 and 14, God has forgiven us all our trespasses and canceled the record of our debt by nailing it to the cross. Knowing and receiving this good news produces peace. That's why Paul talks about feet fitted with the gospel of peace. God the Father is called the God of peace. Jesus is called the Lord of peace and the Prince of peace. The Spirit is called the Spirit of guests. The most often used benediction in scripture is grace and to you. Because you can't experience grace and peace outside of Jesus and unless your sins are forgiven. Only the Christian can have peace. Only Jesus gives peace. Jesus could not even command the woman to live in peace if she was not forgiven of her sin. Look at the world. What they want more than anything is peace. And they can't find it. They can't find it because they are unwilling to see their own sin. Amen. And they're unwilling to come to Jesus for that peace. Ask them. Ask them. Well, I'm going to land this plane. 
by asking you this. Do you know why the woman is not named in the account? Because Simon's named. Why is the woman not named in this account? Answer, because God wants you to put you in her shoes. God wants you to be in her place and experience what she experienced. Because some of you in the crowd, any size, might not be in her place yet. You might be at the table like in verse 49, but you do not know who Jesus is. Who is this? How can this human being have the authority to forgive sins? You don't need to ask that question in 2022 because we know crystal clear that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, even as we sang. He is the one who lived a perfect righteous life and died for the penalty of our sin. Amen. And so the last person I want to speak to here this morning is the sinner. If you have not done so, you go to Christ. Jesus said that all that come to him, he will not cast out. Jesus didn't cast this woman out of the dinner party, and he will not cast you out of heaven if you come to him. It doesn't matter if your sin is 500 denarii or 50. If you acknowledge that you are unable to pay your own debt, Jesus will cancel your debt. And he will say to you, just as he did to the woman, your faith has saved you. From now on, walk in peace. And if you have been forgiven much, then you will love Christ much. If you have been forgiven much, you will love Christ much. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice at your kindness. You are so kind when nobody else and no other thing in this world is kind. You accept all those who are willing to see themselves rightly. You are willing to receive all of those who see ourselves the way that you see us. And I pray uh, that I did not get in the way of what your word says in Luke 7, 36 through 50. And may this word be a glorious exaltation in everyone's heart here of who Jesus is and what he has done. And may they put their faith in him uh, for uh, the promise, the unbreakable promise of eternal life with you, um, but also the promise of the greatest blessing as we uh, continue to walk and abide in you as we wait that day. Uh, we thank you uh, for the confidence that you give us uh, in your word. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.